So hi everyone and thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Amy and I'm the museum coordinator at the North Lanark Regional Museum. We're happy to have the opportunity to bring to you a digital speaker series in 2021. And while this event has no ticket cost, we do encourage you to make a donation to the North Lanark Historical Society. The Historical Society is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to the collection, preservation and presentation of local history. And your donations help to ensure that we can continue to offer these fantastic events. The link to our donation page will be put in the chat box of this meeting. You're welcome to leave your cameras on, but we do ask that you mute your microphones now to limit any background noise. This presentation will be recorded and the video will be used for promotional and educational purposes by the Historical Society and will be posted to our YouTube page. At the end of the presentation, you'll be welcome to unmute your microphones and ask any questions to our speaker, or you can type your questions into the chat box to be answered at the end. Without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker, Brian Tackaberry. Brian is a retired secondary school teacher from Almont and is very involved in community activities in and around the town. He's served on the board of directors as secretary for the North Lanark Historical Society for many years and has been instrumental in building the detailed military collection at the North Lanark Regional Museum. Brian has published two books, The Lost Generation of Mississippi Mills World War I Casualties and Forgotten Heroes, Mississippi Mills Valor Award recipients of the Great War, both of which are available for purchase. So thank you, Brian, for taking the time to prepare this presentation for us, Remembrance Stories of the Great War. Thank you very much, Amy. And I'll see if I can get my uh, share screen. Okay. So as uh, many of you are aware, August 4th, 1914 was the declaration of war. It took place when the Germans uh, crossed the borders into Belgium, which is a neutral country. Great Britain immediately declared war. And because we were part of the Commonwealth, uh, Canada was automatically at war. So believe it or not, it didn't take long for the local area of Canada to get mobilized. As a matter of fact, within a week, a group called the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry that still exists, they're now based out in Alberta, but the original group was started by Hamilton Galt in Ottawa. And this is a parade of them uh, within a week, marching down Bank Street towards Lansdowne Park where they were doing recruitment for the war. In the valleys, we already had uh, the 42nd Lanark and Renfrew Militia Battalion, and many of those people were recruited to start training within a week of the war being declared. And here we have a photograph. This is taken at the Elmont train station, which is located where the current Elmont Library is. This is the first men that were being sent off to war, not for further training immediately, for overseas, but to the headquarters of the battalion, which was in Perth. Each of the communities in Lanark County sent 12 men over. This is the first 12 men that went from the Almont uh, Ramsey Pakenham area. And there were 12 also from Carlton Place, 12 from Perth, 12 from Smith's Falls, and even 12 from the little village of Lanark. And they trained for a while at the Perth Fairgrounds until they were sent down and uh, they enlisted, and you would see a, a standard paper like this when they traveled down to Montreal or to Kingston or wherever. One of the local men here signed up in the month of November, and Ernest, Ernest Amaret was a blacksmith working here. He was uh, originally from the island of Jersey, and this is his attestation papers. Anybody that served in World War I, you can get their attestation papers online through uh, Library and Archives Canada, or if you're also hooked up with Ancestry. Well, the Canadians went off to Camp Valcarche for further training during the month of September and early October, and then were preparing to sail overseas. This is a troop ship that the 2nd Battalion, which is the Eastern Ontario Battalion, that would have been people from Kingston East and up into the Ottawa Valley, uh, there was a Central Ontario Battalion that would have covered sort of the Belleville to uh, Hamilton area, and then there was a Western Ontario Battalion as well. But the 2nd Battalion traveled on this ship, the SS Cassandra. They sailed in mid-October, and it is the largest movement of Canadian troops ever in history. Over 35,000 people sailed at once on the various ships for overseas. 
while that was going on, there was recruitments into other brigades that were being formed. And this is the 21st Battalion that was formed in Kingston. Uh, they were numbered battalions rather than by localities. And uh, we had this postcard that came from the Elmont Legion. We know the names of the people, but they weren't listed in order. But the one fellow that we could identify is this fellow in the middle. And he happened to be the fellow that I had the attestation papers for, Ernie Amaret. And the only reason we were able to pick him out was that we know that he served as a bugler. And you can see that he has a bugle sitting in his lap. This was taken at the grounds of what is now the Frontenac Courthouse in Kingston. And later on, they moved to, for training to Berry Field, which is next to where CFB Kingston is today. Well, once they arrived in England, they didn't actually go over to the front in France and Belgium. They went to the Salisbury Plains for further training, learning to dig trenches and go through military training, bayonet charges, et cetera. Uh, many of them would have had a chance on their free time to see Stonehenge, which is located very close to where the training was taking place. And Salisbury Plains is still used today by the British for military training. Other recruitments were going on after that time. And this fellow is a well-known uh, in Almont, James McIntosh Bell was a geology engineer, graduate of Queen's University and also of Harvard University, who had done work in Australia, New Zealand, Siberia, and the Canadian Arctic. But because of his fluency in different languages and his military background, he was hired to be a captain originally for the 73rd Battalion of the Royal Highlanders of Canada. Today, that is known as the Black Watch out of Montreal. And he served with them until 1917, uh, when due to illness, he was moved back to, uh, to recover in London and he was attached to the war office. Uh, in the latter part of the war, he actually did secret service for the government in Siberia during 1917 and 18 and was awarded the um, uh, military OBE for his service. And we're very fortunate that we have his World War I medals and many materials associated with uh, Major Bell. Now, this is interesting. The 73rd Battalion, as they are today, the Black Watch, are a kilted regiment. And they would have worn these uniforms and the kilts even into battle and in the trenches. But it was very common at the beginning of the war before you went off to get these postcards taken. And here we have five men from Almont and they have posed with an interesting creature at their foot. And we were quite surprised when we came across this photograph. This is a little black bear that became the mascot of the first brigade of Canadians that went overseas. And it was named by a, uh, a veterinarian that traveled with this group who, who rescued him from Northern Ontario and nursed him with a uh, baby's bottles filled with milk until the, the bear grew up. And he was from Winnipeg, so he named this bear Winnipeg. And for short, he was known as Winnie. And uh, the bear became a resident of the London Zoo when the men went off to fight, but it was not uncommon for men to get their photographs taken with this Winnipeg the bear who became later known as, many of you may know if you've read the stories, this is Winnie the Pooh. So here we have five men from Elmont with the original inspiration bear for Winnie the Pooh. While that was going on throughout 1915 and into 1916, this fellow, John de Hertel, he was from Perth and, and later on became the mayor of the town. He took over the Lanark and Renfrew Battalion at the home front and they continued to replenish the ranks of what was the 42nd Battalion uh, that was Lanark and Renfrew and they raised it, but they were renumbered as the 130th Battalion. And they would go from town to town. They actually took members from the various town bands, Carlton Place, Almont, Perth and Smith Falls that were men that were too old to serve or young boys that were too young to serve. And they would go uh, up and down the streets recruiting and holding uh, rallies to promote people to join the service for the war. 
And this battalion went over in, later in 1915, but it was what's called a reinforcement battalion. So the 130th, if you have an ancestor that served with the 130th, did not fight with the 130th in the, in the uh, trenches, but their men would have been taken to replenish the other ranks. So if the second battalion had lost due to illness or injuries or death, maybe 10 men, they would take them from another Eastern Ontario battalion to replenish the ranks. So that was the story behind the 130th. Now, as I said, in the fall of 1914 and even into the beginning of 1915, no one officially from Canada, <coughs> excuse me, fought in the trenches. So none of our local men at all we found had ever gone across in 1914. And in February of 1915, they finally went to the region of Belgium that's known as Flanders, uh, known today as Flanders Fields. Almont's first fatality, as you can see, was on February 3rd, 1915. Frank Smith Brown was a former Boy Scout and a militia man. And uh, because of that, he had also trained to be a marksman. So he was assigned to be a sniper. And he was only in the trenches for two weeks. But over that time period, he was uh, successfully hidden and was able to kill 20 to 30 Germans before they found out where his sniper nest was and the artillery took him out. Uh, he was quite uh, well accomplished uh, in English literature as, and well educated as well. And he wrote poetry. Uh, he had gone to a publisher at the beginning of uh, his service in London, and he wrote several uh, poems put together in a little booklet called Contingent Duty Ditties, and it was published posthumously after he was killed. Uh, we're for fortunate that the Historical Society has a copy of that. Had he lived, he might have been as successful as a poet as John McRae, but unfortunately his life ended very early at the start of the war. In April of 1915, the Germans launched the very first gas attack at Ypres, and the Canadians in the 2nd Battalion were put in charge of reinforcing the lines after they broke with the British and the French. And here you see an outline of what's called Kitchener's Woods, which is in this area. The German lines were here, and the 2nd Battalion were ordered to hold the line at all costs. Now, Hooper's house, which was a farmhouse that was located here, was assigned to the men under Captain William Hooper, who was from Carlton Place, and he was placed in charge of that group of 12 men from each of the four towns in Elmont, and they were Elmont, Carlton Place, Smith Falls, etc., and told to hold it with machine guns at all costs. There was another house up here called Doxy's house, and it was under the command of uh, Lieutenant Doxy, who was from Campbellford, Ontario. Uh, my cousin Sue is from Brighton, so there might have been some people from that Brighton, Campbellford, Trenton, Peterborough region in Doxy's house. Unfortunately, the Germans broke through the lines approximately here and totally overran Doxy's house. The entire group that was there were killed or taken prisoner. Uh, before the orders came through, Hooper realized that there were some issues and slowly tried to get the men out a few at a time because they're under total fire all along the whole line here. Uh, many of the people who were here in that house did get it out, but Carlton Place, of the very first 12 men that were there, six were killed that day, and two of them, Captain Hooper and his second in charge, uh, Sergeant George New, were taken prisoner of war. So the very first battle they are in, they lost eight of their 12 men. Uh, Almont lost two, and they were the Fairbairn brothers, uh, William, who was killed and his body was never found, and his brother George, who was taken prisoner of war. Several other Almont people were, were taken prisoner, but we had some information that came later on on the Fairbairn brothers that I'd like to read for you. Uh, the action took place on weekend of April 23rd, 24th, 1915, when the German counterattack, George and William were amongst the last men who were left in the retreat of Captain Hooper's house. 
George was recruited originally in the official records as wounded and missing in action between April 22nd and 26. A letter written later to, by George to Alex McDonald of Almont was published in the Almont Gazette in June of 1915. And he stated that he had been wounded during the, in the wrist during the attack and was taken as a prisoner into Germany. In the military records, he was unofficially reported as a prisoner of war at, now my German's not very good, Gemalka Funkelen Dolmen in Westphalia by December of 1915 and confirmed as, as official by the government in March of 1916. He had been moved to a prisoner of war cap at Stendhal by December of 1916 and for official purposes, it was reported that he died while he was a prisoner in the Stendhal prison camp in February of 1917, but the government didn't receive official notification until June. Uh, the mother of another fellow prisoner, uh, F. Parker, who was from Elmont, also reported that George died of peritonitis following an operation in prison and was buried with full military honors by the Germans in Stendhal's prisoner of war camp. So today we have Fairburn Brothers Crescent in Almont that commemorates these two young men. Jack Holland was an interesting character, part of the original group. Interesting in the fact that he wrote plenty of letters that were published in the local newspaper before the censorship started taking place of their letters. If you know much about the war, some of the horrors of war were discussed by him. And here is a little bit of an excerpt on one of the letters that he wrote. There are some of our fellows who will never come back. They are buried behind the trenches with wooden crosses to mark their spot. We're all the same when we're dead. Germans have suffered a lot too. We can dig around anywhere near our trenches and you come across a dead man, whether it be German, French, or British. There was a French and a German both buried together in one place where we dug. We held the Germans off for three days, then we had to retire. They were firing poisonous gases and shelling us all the time, which blew the men out of the trenches. We captured a lot of prisoners. They had broken through the French lines and came through in the thousands. We drove them back with bayonets, but they wouldn't stop. We lost heavy, but it's a wonder any of us got away because the bullets were falling just like a hailstorm. One German said, don't shoot Canada. My uncle lives in Canada. One of our men said, that's all right. Tell us where he lives and we'll get him too. Then they put a bayonet through them. The Germans were building parapets made out of their dead soldiers. In one bush, you could not walk without stepping on a dead man. I don't wanna tell anybody what I've actually seen, but this is really not war and I'm still glad that I'm alive. They bayonet our wounded on the field and drop shells on their hospitals. They set them afire with shells and burn nearly them all. I had a Ross rifle, but they're no good. I had to put my foot on the bolt of the rifle the other day before I could open it to put fresh cartridges in it. I threw it away and picked up an English rifle. All the boys now in the 16th Battalion have them. We're going into the trenches when they were coming out. They shouted and asked if we'd thrown away the old rusty Ross rifles. Some of us had them and some had not. I don't have to argue the Ross rifle with anyone. I, I've tried it with a few thousand Germans on the gallop towards us 200 yards off intent on murdering us, but also chase them off in the middle of the night with my bayonet. But they just run like the devil. They can make you dance with their machine guns though when I was on the roof of a building. By 1916, the war had really got into the uh, entrenchments and the Somme was supposed to be the battle that was gonna end the war and break it. The Somme started on July the 1st of 1916 and lasted well for several months. And on the very first day, July 1st, 1916, the Royal Newfoundland Regiment marched across in the open lands of no man's land. And on the very first day, 80% of the men were either killed, wounded or missing in action. And even today, July 1st in Newfoundland because of that is more of a Memorial Day like Remembrance Day than it is to celebrate Canada's history. Uh, luckily, nobody from the Almont area was a uh, part of that, and they moved into the trenches within the middle of the month of July to be part of the next action. I wanted to mention one of the original 12 men, and this was Robert Alexander Murphy. He's kind of unique because he served right through the war from beginning to end and uh, never left 
uh, due to injuries or illness or whatever. And that is quite a feat in itself. At Hill 60 in the middle of July of 1916, he received a military medal and uh, for his valor and a bar, which means a second military medal at Passchendaele in the following year. He did return to Almont for a short time, and then we found evidence that he moved to St. Paul, Minnesota. The Battle of the Somme was raging into the fall months, and this fellow, Lieutenant Alex George Rosamon, a member of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, was killed at Corselet September 15, 1916, age 42. And he would have seen the first use of tanks. That was the battle in which the English uh, unleashed the tanks on the German lines, which totally astonished them. Now, Rosamond was very unique. By today's standards, he would be the town's multi-millionaire. He owned and ran all of the woolen mills in the town of Almont. And as such, he employed about 50% of the people from this community. He was a married man, as you say, 42 years of age at that time, with three daughters. And as such, he would have been exempt from military service. But at the outbreak of the war, he happened to be in England, where he was looking for workers to work in his woolen mills, not knowing that the war was going to break out. But when war did occur, he decided to do his patriotic duty and signed up, even though he would have been exempt both by being a family man and also because of his age and also because of his business background. Uh, he left money in his will for the establishment of the Alamont Hospital. And even today, uh, one of the older wings is called the Rosamond Wing. And he also left money for the establishment of a war memorial that we will show you a little bit later on. So uh, Rosamond, uh, when his death was learned in the town, there was quite a, quite a bit of uh, uh, this uh, upset because it was the announced about the time of the Almont Town Fair. So it was all totally dedicated towards him as well. And uh, there was hardly anybody that was not affected one way or the other by the loss of him. In the preparation for Vimy Ridge over the winter months, there weren't many battles that took place, but the British were uh, conducting trench raids to find out where the German strengths were and weren't. And on March the 1st of 1917 in the Zouave Valley, not too far from Vimy, uh, one trench raid, we had a total of uh, Harry McIntosh, Leslie Alred and Arthur Stratford, all from the 73rd Battalion under McIntosh Bell were killed and James Joss who came back died of his wounds. So, a large group would not have gone over. So this was just a very small group of the platoon under McIntosh Val. He didn't go out himself, but the idea was to try to get some information on the Germans or even bring back a German prisoner of war. But all these little trench raids had uh, quite a loss of life. Very few of them were successful without losing at least one or two people. This is a photograph of Leslie Alred. He was a graduate of Almont High School, served as a scoutmaster for the local Boy Scouts as well. And uh, his body was never found and his name appears on the Vimy War Memorial. Arthur Jones was born and raised in Packenham where his father worked for the bank there. And he enlisted with the 21st Battalion in Kingston. He served at St. Aloy, Corselet, where uh, Rosman was killed and also at Vimy Ridge. And on May 5th, it was reported that at Thelus Caves, which is just the other side of Vimy, he and a corporal captured 100 Germans by themselves. And Jones later shuffled from, suffered from shock and he was granted leave in order to return to Canada to recuperate. Uh, by the end of the war, he moved to Brighton, Ontario, where some of my roots are as well. And he has still relatives or descendants in that, in that particular area. But he was born and raised, as I say, in Packenham, and uh, so he does have a local connection to us. Most of the people you hear about are the people that were killed, but here are two of the men from our area who were uh, in either the French raids or in Vimy Ridge, and they lost legs. And we found this photograph in the Almont Gazette in the fall, and here they were recuperating from their wounds going into United States, which was not at war at that time, and 
trying to get liberty loans for money in order to help with the war efforts in Canada and Britain. And so here they are still doing their patriotic duty, even though they've been shipped home uh, as disabled. Another man was involved in August of 1917 was what we call a homeboy. Uh, he had come over to Canada to work on some of the local farms in this area in 1912. And during the Battle of Hill 70, which was very shortly after Vimy Ridge, not too far from there, he received the military medal. And he also served in the Battle of Passchendaele where he was wounded. He survived uh, and died in 1972. And there are descendants of him still in the Almont area. What's interesting is the photograph that you see, is this would have been taken at the time, they actually received their medals in the field by an officer. And here is a photograph of him taken in France with him wearing the military medal. You did not get your other medals until the war was over. Unfortunately, the family do not have his medals to this day. Not all the people were killed in action in, in the war. Farquhar Fraser had attended Almont High School and was attending Queen's University when the war broke out and signed up to be a bombardier in the Canadian Field Artillery. Uh, he was a corporal at that time and they were in the location of Bethune, France in the front lines. And he was sent to look for some parts for the repair of the wheels on their artillery uh, cannon. And he went over to the commissary's department and he saw something interesting on the, the shelf of the door frame. And he picked it up and said, what's this? Well, it was turned out it had been a German detonator that had been picked up on the field and turned in for disposal, but uh, it was just left carelessly. It exploded instantly, killing him and wounding about three others at the time. So this would be, I guess we would call that a friendly fire incident, but here was a, uh, prospective family uh, in there. His mother was a Caldwell, part of the Caldwell family that owned the Kit Mills factories in Lanark. His father was a lawyer and he was actually studying law at Queen's University. We were fortunate that we got a photograph of him from Queen's University. His original white marker from his grave by that after the war, uh, some families were offered that, but they had to buy them when they went to the standard uh, uh, gray ones that they have today. His mother was sent the original one and it happens to be in the museum of the Perth Museum today because she had moved to Perth where her other family members were. Many of you know from seeing the movie Passchendaele, but hearing, hearing of the, the mud of Passchendaele in November of 1917, the Canadians were sent in to do what the British and the French and the Australians were not able to do, which was to take the town of Flanders. Great cost did take place. They were told as they were going in, if someone falls in the mud, don't go to their aid because they'll probably pull you in as well. Uh, the movie Passchendaele really does show quite a bit of the stuff that was going on with that. But the Almont people were very actively involved in that from most of the contingent uh, battalions that they took part in. In the Battle of Passchendaele, we had six local people that were killed. This is not including those that were wounded. And I wanted to, to mention this one fellow, Warner Bowl, who was a graduate again of Almont High School. He had previously received the Military Cross and the Military Medal, so he was well decorated. He had gone up through the ranks, was just starting as a private, and the others that were killed was Arthur Seal, William Evoy, George Tennant, Edward Gemmell, and Claire Paul. Now, Bowl, by the start of the war, had moved out to farm in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. So most of the people here still considered him to be a resident of Elmont. But because he had moved out west, his name was not put on our local war memorial. Uh, the high school does have a plaque with his name on it because it mentions anybody from Elmont High School, regardless of where they lived, that uh, uh, taken place in the war. But unfortunately, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan has a generic one. So his name does not appear on any war memorial, just the plaque that's at Elmont High School. So we're very pleased that we were able to tell his story in our book, not only as a soldier that was killed, 
but as a hero because of the uh, two medals that he won. Not everybody was involved with the actions on the land. Jim Kirkland, again, uh, was a graduate from Almont High School. He signed up at age 18 with the Royal Flying Corps because Canada did not have its own Air Force at that time. Now you notice that he trained in Camp Mohawk that is located near Deseronto, Ontario. And it was one of the training centers that they used to train pilots for overseas. The other one was near Downsview, Ontario. And uh, in the winter, both Camp Mohawk and Downsview people had to go down to Texas for their winter training. But uh, Kirkland did all his training in the, the summer and fall months. Very interesting that we have a copy of his um, flight log and the fellow, one of the fellows that trained him was called Vernon Castle. Now that name might ring a bell because there was a Fred Astaire movie called The Story of Vernon and Irene Castle many years ago. And Vernon Castle and his uh, wife Irene were famous dancers on Broadway and throughout Europe. And at the start of the war, Vernon signed up to be in Deseronto to train pilots. Uh, he actually drove through the streets of Deseronto in a Stutz Bearcat, and he had a lion cub as his pet. So he was quite a character. But we know that Jim Kirkland actually trained with him. Vernon Castle did dry, die tragically in Texas, where he was training a, another student pilot, and the two of them went down and were killed instantly. Uh, when Kirkland was killed, he was um, shot down and he wasn't a fighter pilot. He was a bomber and photo reconnaissance pilot. And he was shot over German lines on July 20th, 1918. Notice he's only 19 years of age. Uh, I did want to mention a little bit about him because the letter for the co-pilot, the co-pilot survived and he sent the letter home. Now, by the time that Kirkland was killed, he had done 66 bombing raids and six photo shoots. The interesting thing about that is in those days, you're flying as high as seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 feet above there, no parachute, no oxygen. And uh, he had a couple of close calls. At one point, he talks about unfurling his scarf and feel, uh, seeing some pieces of shrapnel fall out. But this letter was sent to his family by Lieutenant Riley, that was his uh, tail gunner. I will tell you as accurately I can of the proceedings of our last fight. Just before leaving the ground on one of our usual bombing raids, the intelligence officer came to our aerodrome and asked if Jim and I would go to get a few exposures of the Bopom ammunition dump on our way to bomb Etricourt a few miles close to Bopom. We said we would and asked our flight commander to lead the flight, which he said he would. After leading the ground and crossing the line, it was apparent through some misunderstandings that he was not really leading us, but kept us on a southeastern course for Etricourt, which would bring us a mile and a half away from Bopam. Jim, being a conscientious man about his work, immediately broke away from the rest of the flight and flew over Bopam. We got the exposures and started to regain the flight, which were some two miles distant when five German machines dropped out of clouds upon us. Our only plan was to give up hope of reaching the flight and regain British lines for safety. We turned and started to cover the nine miles between us and the lines. Three machines got on our tail and two climbed above us and kept constantly diving and firing on us. This was unfortunate because we could keep them at a safe distance behind with our movable quick firing Lewis gun. The two machines above us had us practically at their mercy and we could not get in front of the gun action it being stationary on the front machine. We fought them for some time when the machine above us got a direct burst on us, killing Jim instantly, wounding me in forced places and cutting out our engine. When I was hit, I looked around and Jim was nowhere to be seen. Whether he was killed or only wounded, I don't know. I lost consciousness at 6,000 feet and did not regain it until five o'clock in the afternoon the next day where I woke up in a German field hospital at Bolencourt. I asked about Jim and the German intelligence officer said he had been killed instantly. He had three machine gun bullets through his head and they had probably buried him in the corner of the bus aerodrome that was a big German aerodrome in front of the town of Bopam. 
So all that got sent home from him was a small box that had some of his uh, uh, photographs, a few of his uh, badges and his war diary and also his flight log. So at least something did survive from, from his family. And uh, again, we're fortunate that we have access to that information as well. Well, most people in the area have heard of the fellow called Roy Brown, who, saw, uh, who shot down the Red Baron, Baron von Richthofen, but most people have probably never heard of Kenneth Burns Kahn. And he was Almont's top ace. In order to be an ace, you had to shoot down five planes. Well, Kahn fought in one of the Bristol fighters, which is like the one that you see here photographed, and he shot down 20 planes and received the Distinguished Flying Cross. The only reason we were able to discover him is the, the scroll at Almont High School mentioned his name with the award after it. So we did the research and found that he was from here and uh, later on moved to Toronto following the war and opened up a travel business as well. Another person from Almont who had uh, distinguished service was Major Arnott Greer Morty. He received the Distinguished Service Order and was mentioned in dispatches to uh, the Field Marshal twice. And he rose up the ranks from Lieutenant to become a 16th Battalion's Major. Uh, he was mentioned several times in the war uh, diaries. And in June of 1918, during the summer, he led his men through uh, a campaign and he had been wounded, but he still went on and he survived the war and he's buried in the Aldkirk Cemetery in Almond, Ontario. Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele are the wars that most people are familiar with, but the last hundred days campaign probably had higher fatalities for battalions across Canada uh, than, than the two Vimy and um, Passchendaele put together. The idea was that in August, they were trying to see if they could end the war. And the final push was to put the Canadians at the front of the North area of France and Belgium. Uh, the Australians were a little bit to the South, the English in the middle and the Americans and the French more to the very South end of the front lines. And the Canadians had very high success starting in August. It lasted three full months through several battles, Amiens into Arras and then Canal du Nord. And more of our local men died in these actions, as I said, than in the other well-known battles. Ozzy James is a person that was wounded but survived and he received the highest award for the area, uh, the, the military medal, sorry, not the highest, but the second highest medal for, next to the Victoria Cross, uh, the military medal, and he wrote a letter home to his sister that was published in the paper ex explaining it because he didn't think he deserved it. But here's what he said happened. Dear Ruby, just a few, li few lines to let you know I'm okay. Haven't heard from you in a long time. I'm now out of the trenches after doing the hardest trip I ever had. I've got a few souvenirs, which I'll send home when I get further. I have a dandy pair of binoculars and three good watches. I gave my chum one and sold one for 25 francs, and I still have one left. I've got a lot of German money, but I've given most of it away. I have two five mark bills and one mark and some small change to bring home. I'm gonna send you some when I get a registered envelope. I'll tell you a little story that I experienced on my last trip. One of our battalions was held up in the little town and six of us took our gun away out in front of our men and were surrounded by the Germans. My chum was wounded twice and couldn't run and the other four ran and got away and I was left with McCormick. The Fritz were advancing on three sides of us and there were some enemy snipers behind us. I got Mac's arm around my neck and started out. They fired their machine guns, their rifles, their artillery at the two of us, and there wasn't one hit directly on us. The German snipers were in the trees in a little apple orchard that we ran through and we got away jackaloo. I had a haversack and a mess tin on my back and these were riddled with bullets and my tunic was totally torn. You can talk about having a close call, but that was definitely one. Now they've given me a stripe and I'm now Lance Corporal G. Well, Ruby, I guess I'll close for now. Hope to hear from you. So soon don't forget me, your loving brother, Ozzy. So he did survive. Uh, there are many of James family relatives still in, in this area as well. 
Robert Harvey Cochran, again, was a farm boy from Almont. He still has lots of Cochran relatives in this area. And all of his letters survive. He enlisted and he rose up with the 38th Battalion. The 38th Battalion was an Ottawa battalion that is now known as the Cameron Highlanders of Ottawa. And he went through the ranks from private to lieutenant. Now he talks about an interesting time when he was not able to send some money home for Christmas time because when he became an officer, they had higher pay and coming from a farm family, there wasn't a lot of cash. And he apologized, he said, now that I am an officer, I can't send money home to you for Christmas because I had to buy my own uniform. It was expected that uh, officers had a better looking uniform, but they had to go to proper tailors in London or Paris and had them made for themselves. Uh, at one point, he talks about having his, uh, his assistant go and have his uniforms cleaned and washed. And when the fellow went to pick them back up again, uh, a German bomb had destroyed the, uh, the washing building where everything was located. And he said, I have to go out and buy myself another set of uniforms. He did receive the military cross at the Battle of Canal du Nord, September of 1918. He was killed in action at Cambrai, October 29th. This is getting close to the end. He was age 31. Uh, one of his letters describes some of the stuff that they were seeing. Now, it was interesting. By this time, letters were being censored. Uh, the people that did the censoring were the officers. And at one point, he writes back to his family, I don't have to censor my letters because I'm the officer that's doing it. And he started saying a few things that uh, probably shouldn't have been put in the letters regarding locations or upcoming. But I thought this one was interesting because it talks about the type of actions that they were at by the end of the war. Uh, he reports the following, on October 27th, my company captured a battery that consisted of 18 pounders, five guns, two anti-tank guns, 31 mortar guns, and 250 German prisoners. The fighting grew stiffer the next day, and on the Sunday morning, we were in front and crossed the Douai-Cambrai Road with the town of Cambrai just on our right. We fought every step of the way, and the Bosch had heavy reinforcements where he threw in against us. Words fall short to explain the situation. It was a huge roar of guns, machine guns. I will just have the company until I get out and Mr. Kilo will be back. Now, the citation for his military cross on that particular day was, was written as follows. For conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty during the operations of Bourlon Woods, September 27th to 30th, in the initial attack, he led his platoon in a most determined manner. His company commander became a casualty and he took over the command of the unit, handled it thoroughly with marked skill and judgment. On the 29th, he led his company into the advance and during consolidation, he set a splendid example to his men under heavy machine gun fire, encouraging them to hold on in a very trying position. The last local fatality was a fellow by the name of George Earl McGregor. He was killed on October 30th at Canal du Nord. That was the final canal that the uh, Allies had to cross to, uh, to push back the Germans very close to where the war began. And the last person killed in all of World War I happened to be a Canadian. He was from Nova Scotia, George Lawrence Price, two minutes before the armistice. Everybody knew the war was gonna end, but he was killed by a German's sniper within two minutes of peace being declared. Now on the home front, right, right from the beginning, Almont was involved in raising funds for the Belgian relief, particularly of orphans and widows, because when the Germans first moved in, they killed so many of the people, Red Cross and other groups. The Rosamond mill workers that worked in all the woolen mills under Alex Rosamond were able to raise in the fall of 1914, $10,000. Now remember, think about what wages would be back then. You know, $100 to some of these workers would be a, a, almost a year's salary. Local Boy Scout groups and high school cadets were organized. <clears throat> they actually practiced with rifles in preparing to them. And you will see that some of the people that were local, local cadets and Boy Scouts listed in early years of the war two or three years later, we'll be fighting in the front lines. Interesting to see that 
you were trying to uh, get money through loans and raise money. There were posters all over towns across Canada, war taxes on things, whether it be passing a check, uh, there was uh, postage stamps uh, affixed to things like that. And you might have heard that there was a temporary tax that was done in order to pay for the war. You might be able to guess what it's called. Income tax. So technically, even today, we're still playing for World War I. On the home front, people were encouraged to ration their food. They wanted to make sure that meat and other products were going to overseas. Uh, government issued pamphlets on how to preserve food, to do canning, to do jams, uh, preserve things for over the winter months. Uh, sugar was rationed, gasoline, of course, was rationed. And people were encouraged to knit, to send things to the soldiers overseas. Um, in particular, they were sending socks, they were sending mittens, they were sending toques, scarves, and sweaters. The problem with the World War I uniforms is they were way too hot for the summer and uh, not warm enough in the winter. They did have their great coats, but if those coats got soaking wet, they were uh, very chilly. Uh, the other thing that I didn't mention on here was the other uh, thing that they were encouraged to send to the troops and send off, and, and that was tobacco. Tobacco was considered to be a healthy thing back then, and many of the soldiers were issued with cigarettes from the home front, and uh, they also thought that cigarettes helped keep the smells of the trenches down. They thought that it could also help get rid of the bacteria around, whether it did or didn't, I, don't, I dispute that but uh, it was encouraged that uh, they would send cigarettes. And so, and even money, it was quite surprising to see some of the letters where they say, thank you for sending me the $2 bill the other day. Uh, local newspapers were sent over as well. Letters were sent home and you might notice in this particular letter, this is one that was gone to the Cochran family that I mentioned, this actually says right here, passed by the censors. So if you do see some World War I letters, they were encouraged to write them at the rest stations that were usually sponsored by either the churches, or in this case, this is the YMCA camp. And the letter would have been inspected to make sure they weren't giving out a location. Most of them at the top of them were saying somewhere in France or somewhere in Belgium in order to uh, not give away their locations if the Germans ever got a hold of the letters. This is a sample quick information postcard that the, the family was encouraged to, to receive from them. Uh, even if you were not very literate, you could still check off a box or whatever. And this was like a quick postcard to let your family know that you're alive. Bearing in mind that unlike today, where we have computers and internet and telephones or whatever, the only way you could find out if your relative was still okay was to get a letter. And it would still take the better part of a week to get from the front in order to get it home. Uh, the, the quick postcard was you would cross off whatever didn't apply. So as you see at the beginning, it says I'm quite well on the first line. The next one he's crossed off, I've been admitted to the hospital. Here it says I'm going on well. So, you know, but the other says I'm sick or I'm wounded, hope to be discharged. And the idea is I got your last letter dated such and such. So at least you know that the communication is going both ways. And uh, it also said, on the bottom that it, or on the top. If anything else is added, the postcard will be destroyed. So the idea was this was just a quick, easy piece of information. This is the thing that people didn't want to get, which is a telegram. The problem is you have no two-way communication. This was written by uh, the government to notify uh, not Jim Kirkland, but his brother Hal was a private with the PPCLI and he was wounded three times. This is the last time he was wounded in October. And it says, officially reported, uh, sincerely regret to inform you, Private Hal Kirkland Infantry officially reported admitted to Western General Hospital, Manchester, October 3rd, gunshot wounds, left hand face. That's all it said. Uh, you don't know whether he's gonna lose the use of his hand, is his face marred that he's gonna be disfigured for life. Uh, again. Being in hospital in England is usually considered to be a little bit more serious injury, and you have no way of knowing 
what's going on until you either get a letter back from Hal saying I'm recovering in hospital and doing well, or you get the next dreaded telegram, regret to inform you that he's passed away. Uh, in the case of Cochrane that I mentioned earlier, the family did receive the telegram about his death and three days later received the last letter from him written from his hospital bed before he died. And he was encouraged in hospital to write very cheery things. And you can imagine the roller coaster of the family knowing that he's dead and then reading this final letter saying, well, I'm, I'm doing okay in hospital and I'm expected to recover, knowing that he was already gone. Well, November 11th, 1918 was the end of the war, but the troops were not pulled out immediately. The focus was to get the wounded and sick back first. So many of the troops did not arrive until February, March, or even April of the following year. And there was also a fear that maybe war could break out again. So some particular battalions were left behind to deal with uh, keeping security and also to look after the graves uh, for the Commonwealth Grave uh, Commissions and to start to sort out where the graves were. The town of Almont created what's called the Sacrifice Medal. And it says in the cause of democracy, and this was given to the families of anybody who had a man or woman that was killed. And on the back would be the name of the individual. This was created by Burke's Jewelers in Ottawa and given out to the families. And a few of them do survive in our locality. The town held ceremonies in June of 1919 to thank the veterans that survived and returned. And uh, there was one in Appleton, there was an event in Almont, there was also one in Packenham as well. And in Almont, they gave each of their men a gold ring with his initial on it. And it said uh, uh, inside to thank them for their service. And there was supposedly a certificate. This, this ring is the first one we were able to discover. It belonged to someone who was in Western Ontario whose ancestor had survived and received the ring. Uh, my thoughts is because it was gold, if there were rings left during the depression when money was short, they probably either pawned it or sold it off. So uh, there are very few of them that have survived. And I'm sure a lot of the families did not know today what they are for. Whether the person survived or not, the family received medals. And the three standard medals you see are here. The first one on the left is what's called the 1914-15 star. That was only issued to soldiers that served in the very first years of the war. The second one was the war medal that bears King George V and it's silver. And the bronze one is called the peace medal. And so most soldiers would have had at least the two and possibly the three. If you did some sort of a valor, you may have received either the military cross or the military medal. Military cross was intended for officers, uh, lieutenant, captains and above, and the military medal for the non-commissions. So that would be for the privates, the corporals and the sergeants. It is possible that some who moved up the ranks received both of them. Uh, none of our Local people that we've discovered received the highest honor, which of course was the Victoria Cross. Now, we were amongst one of the first towns that joined what was called the Great War Veterans Association. It was established in 1917 in Canada, but Almont started its own branch in 1919. And the fellow that became the very first president was none other than James McIntosh Bell, who was the highest ranking officer, the major that worked for the uh, Royal Highlanders of Canada. We now know this as the Canadian Legion. So our legion, our local legion happens to be over a hundred years old, 102 years old this year. If you were a soldier that you could not find a grave for, your name would be inscribed in one of two locations. If you died in France, it would be on the Vimy Memorial. And if you died in Belgium, Flanders, et cetera, your name would be on the Menin Gate. And my understanding is that uh, every night at dusk at the Menin Gate, they have a, uh, a reveille with the last post that's played. Uh, the majority of the names on the Menin Gate are British and uh, British Commonwealth soldiers. 
Almont had its war memorial established in 1923 with the opening on September the 11th. This is the size of the crowd. <clears throat> we have one of the oldest war memorials in Eastern Ontario, and it was paid for, as I said, by Le Lieutenant Rosamond's will. And the fellow that designed it was uh, R. Tate McKenzie, who was a famous sculptor, who was a friend of the family, who also was known throughout North America as one of Canada's top sculptors. There's a close up of what it looks like. It was not intended to look like Rosamond, but if you look at photographs of Rosamond and you look straight on at the face of Rosamond, you will see a very similar, it's called the volunteer. Now, if you notice the similarity, anybody that might have been to Edinburgh, Scotland, the National War Memorial in Scotland was designed by the same fellow from Almont. And the Scottish War Memorial has a Scottish soldier with a kilt on, but the pose is almost identical. At the local Mill of Contail Museum, uh, they have the prototype for uh, Mackenzie's statues in um, Scotland, as well of the statue that he did of James Wolfe, which is located at Greenwich, England. Amy mentioned earlier in the talk that we published two books, The Lost Generation of Mississippi Mills. Uh, we were a very small town at that time. We had approximately 500 people from Almont, Ramsey, and Pakenham that signed up for World War I. Of those 500, 100 were killed. So that is a one in five fatality rate. Canada's rate, approximately 600,000, a little over 60,000. So national average is about one in 10. Ours was one in, a, in, in a five. The forgotten heroes, we uh, found out this information on all these war heroes that won medals that have been forgotten. So we did that as well. There's about 40 individuals that had connections to our community and their stories are told in more detail in the second book. So we do have those available. Um, you can contact Amy at the museum uh, if you have any interest in and following up any more military research. So basically we thought this was very fitting to be able to do this as part of Remembrance Week. And as, as always, uh, we hope that this has brought forward some little known history of some of the people that, that fought to keep our country safe and uh, did the supreme sacrifice. So we hope that we would remember. So I thank you for that. No, thank you, Brian. Um, I'll open it up to questions now. And we did have one come in to, through the chat box from Phil Sweetnam and he asked, did the high casualty rate, uh, rate by troops under British Army commanders become public knowledge and thereby affect recruitment? Um, maybe later on, because I know that uh, the local papers started to downplay things uh, earlier on in the, the first two years of the war, they would have pretty long obituaries. And by 1918, and certainly the end of 1917, they would just have almost like casualty lists. They didn't want to go into details. I think it was the less said, the better. Uh, again, conscription had come in as part of 1917. So uh, they certainly were not publishing any of the letters that they were early in 1914, 15. Some of the letters that I've seen published in the paper talked about the rats running across you in the bed at night, and the, the horrors of war and all that stuff was gone by 1916. You weren't hearing any stories back from the home front. So I think there was a point of that. So hope that answers Phil's question a bit, so. Um, if anybody would like to unmute and ask questions, you're more than welcome to. Hi, Brian. It's Linda here. Hi, Linda. That was, that was a wonderful uh, presentation, Brian. And we oh, really fun. enjoyed it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I had a little question. The battalions, the ones that you showed, looked like small groups. Were they small groups or were these just representative oh. of larger groups? The, the actual battalions were pretty big. Each battalion had... I forget how many platoons, some of them 20 platoons. So, so a battalion would be several thousand men, for instance. Okay. So the yeah. platoons were smaller then? The yes. Smaller yeah. units? 
<clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And usually each platoon had a captain and a major, and then the colonel would be the, the big guy, obviously. And yeah. And then above above that is the brigade, which is several battalions together. Well, it was really interesting. So many losses, yeah. eh? So sad. Yeah. All these young yeah. people. Mm. Yeah. That's why we called it the lost generation, because it really was, you know, that mm -hmm. very few families in this area weren't affected either by and 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 we didn't tell the stories of those that came back with uh breathing problems because of the gassing or lost part of their sight or lost a limb or still suffered from shell shock because we did find some evidence of that as well yeah terrible times yeah and those stories are things that we're just learning now like a lot of this stuff was hidden in the families and it's just now that uh, we can access their personnel files and some of the families, as I said, have shared some of the letters home that we didn't even know existed and, and all of this. And, you know, you look at some of the medical records and uh, some of the uh, illnesses were not always for war related injuries. They were uh, from visiting interesting ladies, let's say. And you have to be very tactful on how you deal that with that when you're talking about some of the family histories, but it's all there. So, yeah, yeah, I was saying to Oog that, uh, you know, this must have taken a lot of uh, research and uh, preparation to dig out a lot of this information because it's not trivial to uh, try to find it. We we were fortunate that we got a grant for the first book uh, through Veterans Affairs Canada, and uh, we were able to get the files before they were digitized. Now, unfortunately we had to pay for that. Now they're all up there because we had some of them digitized ourselves, but they had, they sort of misplanned their time. They, they should have had all that stuff out at the beginning of uh, 2014, but it took them till almost 2018 to get all the World War I files done. Uh, they haven't even started on the World War II files. And I'm, you know, my dad served in the war and I had uncles that were in the war and, uh, those files are, if a person was killed in World War II, you can get their files, but for just somebody that could have served, it's going to be a while before they get those done and up and look, open to people. Interesting. Any other questions? Or? Oh, hi, Brian. Oh, hi, Debbie. Hi. You'd mentioned... Uh, that the prisoners of war, when they died, they they died with military, or they were buried with military honors, or something. I forget the wording. Yeah, used. they did. So they would have, you know, a, a standard service. Uh, in, in the case of the Fairburn fellow, they said any of the British and Canadians that were in there, they would be sort of the the color guard. And the the same thing happened even with Baron von Richthofen. Uh, he he died and was. Uh, uh, recovered from his plane over British lines and I think there's actually film of that that survived that shows his you know they built a proper coffin and they had the flag draped over his body and the German flag and everything so well I, I I'm, I'm surprised by that but interesting very interesting great talk Brian thank you very much yeah, thank you you might be interested on von Richthofen he was actually relocated four times oh, and okay it, it was uh because of the, the back and forth of uh, where people were. There's an interesting yeah. article on YouTube on that thing. And I think it was a New Zealand uh, Maori resident um, regiment that sort of uh, carried out the formal- uh, uh, The funeral, the, yeah. The, uh, okay. Carried the coffin during the yeah. service. I suspect they would have had uh, military uh, ministers or priests or whatever but anyway that's yeah and if i could mention one other thing i i visited the Menem gate and they they have something like we we do in canada each day they re read they they play their last post type thing and they they uh uh read they have a book that has all these the people and they read the names of all of the people on one day and it, it's quite a um what say I, I think the right word is tourist attraction. Like yeah. there'd be thousands of people would would attend these things in normal times. I don't know what it's like now with COVID, but uh, they they make quite a business of it. I guess you would say uh, that's maybe a little unkind, but it's it is a very fitting 
memorial, uh, almost as good as 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 Vimy, uh, but um, it's dedicated to all of the regiments rather than where the Vimy is is more for the, for the Canadians that yeah. uh, survived there. Yeah. And and I, when you also mentioned about lists. Um, through Veterans Affairs Canada, they have what's called a uh, virtual Canadian War Memorial. So if you have a soldier that was killed uh, in World War I, World War II, you can get information on them, uh, find out where they were buried, or if they're on something like the Vimy. Uh, some people have submitted photographs of their graves. But the other interesting thing is um, if anybody's been to the Peace Tower and seen the memorial books that are there, uh, that took years to do all the cal calligraphy for, uh, you can actually view the page where your relative, your ancestor is through that particular portal. So it's just the Canadian Virtual War Museum through Veterans Affairs Canada. So anybody that has relatives, and I think it's also been brought up to date for the other ones um, that may have been killed in other wars. Just one other thing you mentioned that the high casualty rates of, in Elmont from during that last hundred days, and in fact, for uh, twenty five percent of all Canadian casualties occurred in that time, because there yes. were really few people who were a few uh, military forces who were capable of doing what uh, Canada was able to do, partly under Curry's leadership. He he had uh, more twenty five percent more than the standard number of people in a regiment. Many of those were engineers that he had great faith in. And uh, he, uh, uh, so he was able to carry that out. The Australians didn't have the draft uh, and the Brits were down to sort of 50% of, and they wanted to get right. Canadians to come and fill the regiments. And even though, was it McNaughton, the defense minister was a bit of a yes. nut. He did at least insist that Canada serve with Canadians. And um, that was, uh, a, a fortunate move and Curry certainly used his men uh, well. And just another comparison, he, he was a, a good strategist. You mentioned that um, the British and the French and others couldn't take Passchendaele. He went after his success at uh, Vimy Ridge and Hill 70, uh, he was told to go to uh, Passchendaele. He didn't want to because it would, he said it, it was just a lot of mud and it would take 14,000 casualties. He, he estimated the casualties within 250 uh, people, uh, within 250. And, and I guess I, I don't have a lot of respect for the, for the British uh, way of handling this, but they were so anxious after having lost over a half a million people at, at Passchendaele that the High command or whatever they call it, central command, ask is have has Passchendaele been taken, and uh, the answer was back yes it was. Next yeah. morning in the papers, yeah, Passchendaele in British hands. Yes, you know, of course. We yeah. lost the fourteen thousand. We had the fourteen thousand casualties. Now, a pittance compared to what the the poor British uh, people had experienced, but Curry was really an. an underrated, I think, uh, general who practiced and uh, had the, the right techniques to to uh, work for that war. Anyway, thank you for the time. To, yeah, that was good. my experience in visiting those areas. And Hi, I, wanted to re I wanted to recommend also, um, if people want to do some general reading on the Canadians, two books were written by oh, Tim Cook. Tim Cook is the uh, top historian with the um, War Museum. And one of them the Canadians were nicknamed the storm troopers in those days because they could get the stuff done uh, under extreme conditions. So you, did, you didn't mention it, Brian, but in specifically, but some of the reasons why some communities have such high casualties was this whole idea of recruiting the battalions from a local area. And this is what you know what happened to the Newfoundland Regiment in Bogomali. They 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 happened to encounter a terrible terrible battle, and of course, the, and they were decimated, and they were all from uh, one local area. And this this probably accounts for why Alma has such a high rate too, because of the 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 battles that 
particular battles that were fought by the local regiments and local battalions. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and they and they did try to keep people with their localities as well, so that if if you moved around from another battalion, the seventy third battalion, for instance, was almost wiped out after Vimy Ridge, and they took the survivors of them and moved them into two other Black Watch battalions, the forty second and the thirteenth, who they probably did some training with. So the idea was to to be with familiar people with familiar uniforms and and localities too, because you knew each other. Hi, Brian, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great uh, presentation. I just wanted to uh, emphasize the sacrifice that Canada made, and you alluded to it. I think at one point you mentioned 60,000 dead. Yes. We only had a population of 6 million people. That's 1% That's right. of the population, yeah. or 2% of the male population of Canada was lost in the First World War. Can you imagine the leadership we lost and the oh, greatness yeah. we lost and what a sacrifice that was? Yeah. I think it compares well with uh, yeah. most other countries, especially uh, with Britain. I was, I've, I've been a long time living in England and uh, these small villages is remarkable. It's, it's just like Almont. Yeah. Tiny, tiny little population. And you're looking at 50 to 100 people dead from the village. Under War Memorial, Memorial, War Monument. Yeah. Very, almost exactly like what we have here in Almont. So I think we can be very proud of our, our troops from this area. Yes. Yeah. Brian. And, and of all our Canadians. Can you imagine 2% of the population? Yeah. Thanks, Hi, Ron, Brian. go ahead. Go ahead, got Ron. A got a local question. One of your slides um, named a Gemmel, Gemmel. And is Gemmel Park named after that person? Uh, no. Uh, the the Gemmel family had been around for about 100 years prior to that. Uh, that particular Gemmel was from Packenham, but he would be related to the original Gemmels that Gemmel Park is named for. Yeah. Thank you. Any other it's questions or comments? Yeah, I just, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm not used to this. I know I did attend a couple of them, but I, uh, I find it very off-putting actually. But um, I just wanted to mention the Ross rifle. That was a disaster. Yes. Uh, you know, it's just uh, unbelievable what was done to the Canadian troops by giving them that rifle, which was only good for big game hunting in Africa and crap for what we for the, for use in the muddy fields of, uh, you know, the, of the First World War. So that was our gift to the Canadian troops, not to mention the crap, terrible uniforms they were given. So they uh, they persevered anyway. I think they used to throw away the Ross rifle as soon as they could get it and get one of the British weapons if they possibly could. The Lee Enfield, yeah. And and that's taught in the uh, history courses now in, in high school. They talk about the disaster of the Ross rifle. Again, it was government kickback that Sam Hughes, who was the Minister of Militia and Armaments, yeah, he had connections with the, the fellow that was producing it. And the British used this Lee Enfield, which stood up far better under yeah, rain much, and much more reliable. Mud and, yeah, it was very reliable. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. A, just a, yeah, Brian, listen, a just an aside, Elizabeth's brother, Dr. John Chadwick, along with two other fellows, wrote a book on the Ross rifle. It's about a thousand yeah. pages thick. I don't know if you've seen it. No, but if I you haven't, haven't, I'm gonna bring it into the museum. Ron, you had something? Yeah, regarding the Ross rifle. When I was uh, in air traffic control at Goose Bay, I bought a Ross rifle from a hunter. Okay. And, yes, and I took one look at the bolt, which was in two pieces, and I realized that it had been put in the wrong way, which is what the big failing of the Ross rifle mm -hmm. was, because when you fired it, half the bolt would go through your head. And I threw it away myself. <laughs> as, as, uh, uh, oh. Go ahead, John. I'm just saying thank you. I have to leave, but I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Thanks John. As uh, Alex uh, mentioned, it was not only the Ross rifle and the uniforms, the boots were just horrible for, oh, yeah. for, the, for the, the Canadian uh, soldiers. And uh, 
Um, anyway, and you mentioned the the uh, the idea of or, or that an election had been fought on the idea of conscription, and it was a little bit of I would say a little bit of gerrymandering in that you women got the first opportunity to vote if you were related to a soldier or you know that there was it was good that women finally got the the right to vote or if you were were a soldier or whatever so that it, it meant that they would have more people who were uh, in favor of uh, the the conscription and in Goulburn, I know uh, the the campaign was based on the idea that farmers wouldn't have to uh, serve, but when that yes. was the selection promise, but when they actually got to implement it, it was one one farmer didn't have to serve, the others would serve. So it, it was, uh, uh, you know, a bit of a, a gerrymandering thing and not uh, too too honorable. At the end of the day, though, it did allow, uh, we did have the, the people to uh, do that 100-day campaign and end the war earlier than expected. And uh, just uh, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I think it was Alex that mentioned the excellent efforts of Canada. I, I think that uh, Arthur Curry is really underrated, but in his memoirs, the British Prime Minister said if it had gone into 1919, he would have put uh, uh, Arthur Curry in, in charge of all of the troops. So anyway, some in, interesting things that I've uh, read and saw in the tours of that area. It's worthwhile covering it as long as you don't try to do it on days that, that are uh, like Bimmy Ridge where they over, over designated or had too many people coming and they're just not capable of hand, handling that. But on ordinary days, it's a, a good uh, place to visit. Thank you. And the other thing too is when they did have the conscription, they used to have panels that would uh, see whether persons were eligible to be exempt or not. And they would publish that in the local papers. So so-and-so tried to be uh, ineligible and that was denied. So it was almost a public shaming of people that uh, tried to get out. And in the case of farmers, if you had three or four sons that were of age, you were encouraged to do it. We we had the case of one family, the Fishendons, and they had five boys and five girls and four of the five signed up and yet they were farmers. So, and uh, that was even pre-conscription. A lot of them just thought it was their patriotic duty. It's surprising. Especially, it seems to me in, in your response to the first question that, uh, the, the British were almost in, you know, I guess it's easy to be an armchair general, but they knew the times that the uh, the Battle of the Somme was going to convince. They had a, a one terminal type telephone system that the Germans could uh, hear what was going on or knew what to expect in the times and everything like that. It's uh, It was really uh, a, a case of real in, incompetence. And they told them ahead of time that the, the when the Newfoundlanders were going out, that the, the uh, barbed wire and stuff was still in place, but they, the Hague wouldn't believe it. Anyway, yeah. it's uh, uh, I'm surprised they got as many people to to uh, help us uh, to help uh, with the war as as they did. But Canada certainly is, I think, as uh, Alex mentioned really underrated in its uh, service there. I think the, their service in World War I was just absolutely outstanding. It was great in World War II, but even better for the population that we had uh, in World War I, in my humble opinion. Moran, great talk. I wonder if you remember, Thanks. have you read anything about when people were coming back in 1919, if they were facing pandemic then? Oh, Canada. yeah, actually, it was quite interesting because that's just about the time that the uh, the Spanish flu was coming. And uh, right. we had a couple of people and they're considered war deaths. If you died of flu mm -hmm. while you were on active service, you're considered a war death. Uh, there was one fellow in Carlton Place that uh, lived in uh, not Black's Corners. It's it's just where you turn off to go to Ferguson Falls. 
And he was training in Kingston. He was sent home in September to do the fall harvest in 1918 before they went overseas uh, for this last campaign. And he got the flu and died. And he's considered a war fatality because he was on active service and was given a two week furlough to help bring in the, the fall crops. And uh, it's amazing when we talk about the numbers, uh, a lot of people don't realize there were 50,000 Canadians that died of the Spanish flu. And, you know, we had just suffered 60,000 deaths in the war, but nobody knows about the 50,000 that died from the flu because the war was, I guess, was a bigger story, but uh, it just didn't get talked about the same. And yet a house, houses lost whole families, you know. Invisible enemy in this case. Yep. And well, I think hundred years late, hundred years later, here we are again. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, a big thank you again to Brian for taking the time to prepare your presentation for us. And I think in this time of remembrance, it really was an important reminder of all of the sacrifices that were made by people in our community for us and for future generations. And so, to those in our audience, thank you once again for your support of the North Lanark Historical Society. We are constantly aiming to improve our programming and would therefore appreciate if you could complete a brief survey on today's event that will be sent to you by email. And in that email, we will also have a recording of the presentation for you to watch back if you're interested. So we hope that you enjoyed today's event and we really look forward to seeing you soon.